Hi guys, today we're going to be reviewing Tut's Theorem, but before we get into that, let's remind ourselves of some of the basic definitions we will need to understand the proof. A graph is a finite simple one complex. It's also sometimes defined as a collection of vertices and edges between vertices. Here we have drawn a graph of a pentagon. A component of a graph is a collection of edges and vertices such that you can trace a path to any other edge in the component, but you cannot trace a path to any vertices of another component. These are two components of the shown pentagon. A subgraph is a collection of edges and vertices that are in some larger graph. A perfect matching is one example of a subgraph, as is this pentagon, in relation to its original graph of a pentagon surrounding a five-point star. A perfect matching is a collection of edges such that every vertex is incident with exactly one edge. Here, we show a hexagon and its subsequent perfect matching. Now, let's consider the logic behind a proof by contradiction. In this sort of proof, we assume that a claim is not true, then show that the negated statement cannot hold, thus proving the original statement true. For example, with these sheep, if we were going to hypothesize that not all of the sheep were normal, we could assume that they were all normal. But this would imply that Virag, the black sheep, was normal. I heard that. A clear contradiction, proving our original theorem that not all the sheep are normal. With these concepts under our belts, we can understand Tut's theorem. Tut's theorem states that a graph G with vertex V has a perfect matching if and only if for every subset of vertices S, which is a part of or all of V, the graph induced by V minus S has a number of components with an odd number of vertices less than or equal to the number of vertices in S. Let's take this hexagon, for example, which we've already shown has a perfect matching. We circle the bottom two vertices, name them S, and then the top four is a component named V minus S, we can clearly see that the component has four vertices, which is an even number. So there are zero components with an odd number of vertices, since four is even. Therefore, since zero is less than two, two being the number of vertices we removed in our initial S, we can prove that the graph has a perfect matching. This works for any subset S in a graph with a perfect matching. Oh, yes! 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 We got it, baby! We got it! We got it! Woo! Woo! We got it! Yes! Our question now becomes, why does this happen? Here, we can finally start exploring Tut's theorem in our proof. Assume this is G, and it's a graph which satisfies the condition that the number of odd components, G minus X, is at most the number of X, but has no perfect matching. The condition with x equals the empty set yields that the number of vertices in G is even. Now, let G prime be the maximal graph of, v, of the vertices of G containing all edges of G and having no one factor. Here, I, I maximize the graph of G into G prime and name V1 the vertex that is connected to every other vertex. V of G is the collection of all the vertices in G, as I've drawn here. V1 still being in the same position as it was in G prime, our maximal graph without a perfect matching of G. V2 is VG minus V1. Now, let G double prime be the subgraph of G prime induced by V2. We claim that G double prime consists of disjoint complete graphs. Adjacency is an equivalence relation on V2. And you can see that these are disjoint complete graphs since there are two vertices and a triangle. Suppose to the contrary that there are A, B, and C vertices that are members of V2, as I've labeled here, with A, B, and B, C being edges that exist in, ver in G prime, and AC not existing. We're going to have a quick interjection before we continue right now.
We can go through and check each graph to see if the theorem holds, but doing that, we would not be able to establish that it is always true. Instead, we make an argument on a general graph which has any number of edges and vertices. We represent this general graph with a squiggly line attached to a blob in this graph. In the graph that we have drawn, we cannot find an edge AB which would fit the conditions of the assumption of transitivity because an edge, such an edge is impossible. Instead, we will use a general argument to show that if such an edge existed, it would be a contradiction. Thus, we are actually using a contradiction to contradict our original proof by contradiction, which would prove our original theorem. We are going to add an imaginary edge, AB, to the graph G prime to demonstrate the logic of the argument in the general case. But it is important to remember that such an edge cannot and will not really exist for the reasons we are about to show after we add the edges AC and BD. As B is an element of V2, we find a point D such that BD is not an element of VG. By the maximality of G prime, G prime plus AC has a one factor F1, as I've labeled here, and G prime plus BD has a one factor F2, one factor being a perfect matching. Now here, obviously, AC is a mem is a element of the set F1 and BD is an element of the set F2. But AC is not an element of F2 and BD is not an element of F1. The union of F1 and F2 decomposes into disjoint edges and cycles. Here we see it decomposing into one cycle itself. Let C be the union of F1 and F2 containing AC. Removing BD and AC from C, we get two paths, one of them having D as an endpoint, as shown here. Let's name this path P. We can assume without loss of generality that the other endpoint of P is A. Then C prime is P, the path, plus BD plus AB and it's a cycle which alternates with respect to F2. Removing the edges from F2 that F2 and C1 have in common, but adding the other edges of C1, as shown here, we get a perfect matching, which is a contradiction. matching is only the edges which compose G prime, as it does not include BD or AC. Thus, this perfect matching is only a perfect matching of G prime, a contradiction as G prime is defined as not having a perfect matching. And there's another one! That's never- you got to be kidding me! Wow! Since G double prime contains only disjoint cycles and edges, it must contain more than V1 odd components as, if it did not, each cycle could one factor, and each vertex of V1 could connect to one of the cycles that had a one factor. Thus, the subset V1 does not satisfy Tut's theorem, as there are more odd components in the graph induced by G prime minus V1 than there are vertices in V1. Since V1 does not satisfy Tut's conditions for G prime, it also does not satisfy it for G. Thus, when G does not have a perfect matching, Tut's condition is also not satisfied. So by contraposition, when Tut's condition is satisfied, G has a perfect matching. Now consider the implication in the other direction. The logic behind this direction is not nearly as complicated. Imagine that G has a one factor. Then you separate G into a collection of disjoint components, each with two vertices, effectively creating a perfect matching. Now imagine that you remove a point from the perfect matching. Now there will be one component which is odd, and the rest will be even. When you add back the edges of G, which are not in the perfect matching, you will always connect pairs of even components, giving all components an even number of vertices, except for the component connected to the vertex, which was originally paired with the vertex that was removed. Thus, the most odd components in a graph G, from which you remove any number of vertices, is the number of vertices that you initially removed. I saw the light fade from the sky On the wind I heard a sigh